Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to our latest HD Base T extended webinar. Uh, my name is Ian Griggs. I'm the uh, community manager for the Alliance. Um, we'll be starting our uh, session in just a few moments on defending your AV systems from cyber attacks. Um, very uh, excited today to be um, having this webinar presented by uh, HiSec Labs, who is um, uh, probably the foremost expert in this uh, in this field and their presenter and I'll uh, get to that um, in just a moment. A uh, quick reminder also is next Thursday same time we will be having uh, another uh, webinar on um, uh, paving the uh, the way to a industry standard through cloud uh, hardware as a service so I encourage everybody um, to sign up for that. Uh, it's uh, you can find it on our LinkedIn page, and that'll be hosted by uh, HD Base T Alliance co-founding member um, Valen Semiconductor and HD Base T uh, contributing member Excite, and should be a really interesting um, discussion. So uh, again, today's uh, session is on defending your AV systems uh, from cyber attacks, and it's going to be uh, our presenter is. HiSec Labs, a little bit about the company. Uh, they were, uh, they're an Alliance member and they were founded in 2008 in Israel. They have a second manufacturing site in the United States. Uh, they are deeply embedded in the defense industry um, and really uh, developing cyber protection solutions for some of the um, most sensitive um, real world applications and their customers include some of the world's leading governments, defense organizations, banks, healthcare providers, and uh, national infrastructure companies and more. And their company motto is to win the war without a fight is the greatest victory um, by probably the greatest general of all time, Sun Tzu. About today's presenter, uh, excited to be joined by Zohar Vered. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for HSL. Uh, he leads all their marketing activities worldwide um, and he also uh, possesses over 20 years of experience in global high-tech product marketing information technology and software systems analysis so we're really excited um, to have him um, and we have a really robust uh, program uh, to, for you today so uh, without any further ado i'm going to turn it over uh, to Zohar now uh, thank you for the opportunity, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Uh, and I'd also like to, uh, before I officially turn it over, if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to submit them and Zohar will try to address them uh, as we go along. And of course, we'll have a Q&A session at the end uh, in the event that um, not everybody's question was, uh, was addressed during the presentation. Okay, sir, I will turn it over to you. Okay. So thank you everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to show you our products and the technologies that we're working with. And I'm hoping it's going to be interesting for everyone. Again, like Ian said, if you have any questions, just shoot them by the chat and I'll try to answer them in real time. If uh, we won't have enough time, I'm going to uh, obviously answer them after the session. So thank you everyone. Uh, again, today we're going to talk about KVM Extender AV security in general. Uh, Ian has introduced HSL perfectly. We focus on you know, the bigger problem of security of the most sensitive customer. We're not only touching a cyber attack on a lower level, but we try to protect governments, organization, national infrastructure, defense, and so on. And they have a much higher standards and much greater demand from AV security than other customers that are worried about a simple cyber attack, ransom attacks, and so on. So we're creating products that will be, uh, withstand attacks by superpower, by countries, not by individual or organization, but by, by, by countries or even superpowers. Uh, for that, we are working in compliance with multiple international certification. We're gonna take you through our portfolio in the cyber uh, security of extenders we're going to talk about what's there to uh, protect in a, in in a, in an extender in a AV solution. How do we protect it? 
we're going to go to basic terminology of what is a protection profile, what is the difference between different versions of the protection profile, and we're going to present different use cases by which you can attack a system through the AV and uh, to other exposures. And finally, we're going to show you our products, both secure and uh, non-secure, uh, that meets those standards that we've discussed. Okay. So again, if you have any questions or you would like to know more, you can send me the question in the chat and I'm going to try and answer it in real time. If I won't see it, then I will, uh, if I won't have enough time or I won't uh, be able to answer all of them, I will uh, answer after the session. Thank you. So, wait just a second. Okay, so our KBM extenders, uh, if we want to look at them from the top down, at the end of them, everybody knows what's a KBM extender, video extender, AV solution, and so on. But we are doing two things that are different than most users. There are some functional differences that we're going to talk about later, but there are two main differences in terms of security that are easy to, ca to catch and understand and are easy to explain. One, we are compliant with NIAP common criteria PP4 certification. So this is, uh, we're going to talk about what is NIAP and what is the protection profile and what is common criteria a little bit later, but we are compliant with international standard and uh, both American and international standard for the AV security market. I'm always saying that sometimes a lot of the users are not asking about the security, they're more asking about certification because it's not clear uh, to many users, what are the security differences? But when there is a certification, it's very easy to explain it to them and uh, to, to give them the value of the product. But we're going to go through the design as well, and we're going to explain a little bit more about what is secure, what is the difference uh, between the different products. So that's one thing. Secondly, we make our product in the US. We have, as Ian uh, correctly said, we have factory in Huntsville in, Al in Alabama. And we built all of our products in the US. So our products are both BAA and TAA compliant. This is not only adding to the security, supply chain security, making sure that from the moment the unit has left the factory, it has not been tampered with and secure because they're all coming up, but also in the supply chain built by in, in a trusted facility that we're building other products in, in uh, Huntsville in Alabama. So a secure KVM, let's talk about a secure KVM extender and what is the difference between a secure KVM extender and a regular KVM extender. So when we're building a secure KVM extender and a secure certified KVM extender, meaning compatible with NIA PP4, which I'm going to explain in a second, but when we're building it, we have to be compliant with the standard. So the standard is specifically uh, mentioning which interfaces can be certified and which interface can pass from side to side. And the other thing that it says, it's assuring unidirectional flow information from side to side. So the interfaces that can be certified, again, whether it's copper or fiber does not matter. We can do a copper extender or a fiber extender. We have both. But uh, the, the two interfaces that we have for the extender are video. And USB is only for keyboard and mouse, so-called HID devices. If you look at the diagram that I'm sharing, you can see that, again, the video is unidirectional, meaning video only flows from the computer or from the source. It doesn't matter if it's computer or video. So only flows from the computer or the source to the display, okay? It goes through active uh, component that will uh, remove any possibility to, uh, for the uh, video to flow back or to send back. We're making it unidirectional. We're all also terminating any interfaces that are bidirectional, like HEC, CC, HDCP, all kinds of those interfaces needs to be terminated and cannot pass through the extenders because they're bidirectional, meaning they can transfer information back and forth uh, on it, and the EDID transfer is done by user demand, meaning you can't just send EDID information at will, but you you do it based on a button or it's startup, it depends on the, the product that you select, but again, it doesn't affect the user, but it uh, prevents the vulnerability of being able to send information back and forth uh, with the AV equipment. 
The USB interface is limited to keyboard and mouse. We have an emulation that is limiting the use of the USB to keyboard and mouse only. We also have an emulate. We have uh, two sides to the emulation. We have the receiver side and the transmitter side, meaning we are converting the, the USB communication from USB to RS-485. We send it via RS-485, and then we send it back, and we construct it back to uh, be insecure. And we're also adding a, an optical data diode that is assuring uni, uh, unidirectional flow of information that you can't reverse with software. Meaning the whole point of the product is not to allow an attacker the ability to change the firmware of the product and uh, change the behavior, but uh, it's all depending on hardware and we're, all our security mechanisms are depending on hardware and not software, which is preventing any remote attack or, uh, or being able to change the software easily. The product itself is just like an extender that you know, it will extend, it will have the same features and functionality as a normal extender, other than the fact that the USB is limited to keyboard and mouse, and the uh, video, the EDID acquisition will not, uh, will, will not be done if you change the display in real time, but we'll have to either press a button or restart the receiver or something in order to acquire uh, EDID. Okay, this is creating a solution that is unidirectional, monitored, and also certified by, uh, by uh, NIAP, which is an international organization based in the US. We're going to talk about that in a second. So if I'm looking at the USB, uh, about a USB extender uh, functionality and about UXC extender uh, security attribute, we're talking about several different attributes that can be highlighted and can be talked about and we can show the user. First of all, the USB, as I said, is unidirectional. You can't send information back on the USB line. Typically, USB is obviously bidirectional. You can send you a, a, a commands from side to side, and those commands that are sent from side to side can transfer information that you don't necessarily want to transfer. Our USB interface is obviously bidirectional or unidirectional. It will only send the command from the user, meaning from the receiver, to the transmitter. No USB information will, will be sent the other way. So our emulation will emulate to each side the correct device, meaning we're going to give the PC side an emulation of a keyboard and a mouse, and we're going to emulate to the keyboard and the mouse, which were connected on the receiver side, we're going to give them a computer, like we're going to emulate a computer for them. So all the uh, keep alive events that they need to get, everything will be received from us, and we're going to only send the uh, uh, USB reports with the payload, we're going to send them only one way and we're not going to allow them back. Also remember that that unidirectional is enforced by a hardware component which is not controlled by software at all. It's based on optical light and it's only sent one way. So that's about USB. EDID acquisition is a very important uh, piece of the acquisition uh, or the transfer or the security of information using extender. EDID uh, acquisition is allowing us to transfer quite a bit of information from the host side to the uh, uh, display side. So typically, as you probably all know, when I start a device, there's a hot plug event, then I'm pulling the EDID file from the monitor and that EDID transfer is not finishing there because there are other commands like brightness and so on that can be sent all the time from the source to the display to change the behavior. Those commands can always be, uh, can always be used to transfer information that I don't want to use. Our EDID acquisition mechanism is controlled. It's also emulated, meaning there's no direct communication between the uh, display and the host, meaning everything goes to us. We're like men in the middle to filter all the information. And we're only allowing that EDID acquisition or that transfer of information in specific time when the user press the button or when uh, it's startup or something that is controlled and we can make sure it's not happening again. HDMI and DP security, again, are very key factor uh, of our security. First of all, DisplayPort, in terms of security, uh, it's a very robust proto, uh, viewing protocol, very commonly used 
uh, in a lot of uh, obviously displays and hosts and sources and all that. But in terms of security, DisplayPort is a security nightmare. DisplayPort includes an auxiliary channel, which is bi-directional, completely open and unfiltered, that is allowing to filter and send a lot of messages back and forth from the host to the device. That allows to transfer almost any type of information from the host to the device and back with no filtering or no supervision whatsoever. So the first thing that you do, we're doing when we're protecting a DisplayPort KVM extender, we're converting DisplayPort to HDMI because HDMI doesn't have the chance. So we're just adding a converter. So the DisplayPort will become HDMI. On HDMI, there's a specific interfaces that we are not allowing, like HEC, ARC, all kinds of ACT, HDCP, uh, and so on. Uh, CEC, all kinds of interfaces that are bi-directional by nature, and, but we're terminating them, we're not, meaning we're not connecting those pins at all. And then the rest of the signal, we send it by an active converter or active retriever, retimers, and different components on the line that will make the signal unidirectional and will not allow. Obviously, we need to disconnect the five volts line that goes from side to side. And there's really, in order to protect a, a video interface, especially in high frequencies, you need to disconstruct the signal pin by pin and then make sure that each of the pins is handled correctly because otherwise you either will transfer information which uh, you don't want to transfer or you will uh, uh, damage uh, the integrity of the picture and we won't be able to uh, send it. The last feature that uh, we can talk about is tamper-proof design. Uh, our design and is, is it's designed and it's certified, of course, to have tamper-proof, meaning customers or users, in a way, it's difficult to open the device and tamper with the unit. We also have tamper evident labels and seals that are preventing anyone from uh, or opening the units without the user uh, getting the unit, knowing that the unit was open. Meaning the device is, uh, is tamper proof uh, to an extent that you won't be able to open or uh, interfere with the unit. Okay, so these are the main features uh, we can share. Again, there are obviously more features uh, that are part of the design, all kinds of filters that we're adding, ground isolation to make sure that you can't signal from side to side via the ground line. And again, a lot of uh, features and uh, security mechanism. Uh, just, again, it's very important to remember that in our design, both the transmitter and the receiver are secure, meaning technically you can take a non-secure transmitter and connect it to a secure receiver or take a, a secure or non-secure receiver and connect it to a secure transmitter and you will still get the same level of security like using both of them. This is a key factor when you're using some sort of an HD, uh, HD based matrix that it for example, if you have them on the receiver, so you create a transmitter uh, secure, but the matrix itself is not secure and it's got regular receivers, you can create all kinds of setup like that. Like that. And it's, uh, again, uh, creating a very powerful solution. Uh, the unit itself, but the units themselves are tested and certified as a set, meaning you were using both of them and we're certifying both of them as a set, which is the recommended way to use them. So let's talk a little bit about terminology, maybe what, what terms are we involved and what are we talking about? And maybe to explain a little bit better uh, the security and the certification process that will uh, undergo. So the first term I want to talk about and explain is common criteria. Common criteria is, a, you can say it's as a framework, but it's sort of an organization that was formed by uh, about 17, if I remember correctly, countries. And those countries have decided that they're going to share their certification resources between the countries to allow more security and better uh, commonality between the different countries. So in common, by common criteria, if I certify a product in one common criteria country, in one country that has adopted common criteria, 
that certification will be valid under the Common Criteria Portal, and then it will be valid in all countries that are supporting Common Criteria. It will be published, and then the certification is the same in all processes. This is creating huge benefit, a huge uh, commercial benefits for for vendors. Because if before I had to go to Sweden certify my product, then I had to go to Norway certify my product, then I went to the UK, then France, then Spain, and so on and so on and so forth. Now it's enough for me to do one certification, and I'm certified in all those countries, the same as if I've certified in that country. Okay. So, uh, Common Criteria Certification is a very, very valuable tool uh, for organization to certify their product and gain, uh, and for the industry to gain some sort of uh, joint standard that everybody can work with. Now, when you do Common Criteria Certification, you do it via a certified lab. Obviously, every country has multiple certified labs, but uh, you do it with a certified lab. And you do it based on one of two options. Either you do it based on a security target or based on a protection profile. Okay, a, a protection profile, I'll start with that, a protection profile is a document which defines the threats on one side, the security measure to prevent those threats, and the different class of security devices that can meet those uh, security threats. So in our case, we have a protection profile for PSD, for, uh, for uh, peripheral sharing device, peripheral sharing device, PSD, and that PSD is defining what is needed to protect against peripheral sharing devices to share different devices like keyboard, mouse, uh, uh, video, and so on, how to share them, what are the security measures, what are the tests that we need to do, and what are, uh, like, how do I need to prove that I'm compliant with, with the standard. The process for certification is quite long, it takes depends where you do it and how you do it and depends how many products but let's say about a year uh, from start to end uh, to certify a product like that. The second way that you can certify is a uh, common criteria is via something called a security target. Security target is a document written by the organization which is replacing the protection profile and allowing them to uh, uh, define their goals, their certification requirements, the tests that they're doing. Essentially, it's a protection profile written by the vendor because it's not that every product in the world has a protection profile. So Common Criteria uh, has a certification path for organization or for products that doesn't have a certification, a protection profile, a predefined protection profile, and you can take it and certify it based on a security target. Okay, you define this is my product, this is what I want to do. Obviously, uh, uh, the security target that you're writing needs to be approved by the scheme where you submit. I can't just submit a product saying it's secure because I'm saying so, or it's secure because I feel like it. You have to say something meaningful, and they need to approve that the product that you're trying to certify has some sort of validity to being secure, uh, certified. And the process, again, as I said, is quite lengthy. It takes about a year for men to end. Now, each country has their own certification scheme. And as I said, once you certify in one country, you, sell, you are certified in all of them. The only, the only uh, uh, exception to this is NIAP. NIAP is the American agency. Uh, which is sort of between the NSA and the uh, NIST, which is the National American Standard of Institute of Standard. And they're part of, they're the American version of common criteria, or they're the American agency that is enforcing common criteria. And uh, NIAP is only accepting certification. Again, there were cases in the past that they've accepted something else, but currently they're only accepting certification that are based on a protection profile. You can do it in the US or you can do it elsewhere, but you need to do it based on the protection profile with a model called strict adherence, meaning you have to meet everything in the protection profile. You can't claim. In a security target, you can write whatever you want, and as long as it makes sense to the certifier, it's okay. If you want to be certified by NIAP, you have to go by the protection profile 100%. You can't de deviate from the protection profile at all. 
Now, if some of you knows those uh, common criteria certification, they might have, they might remember terms like EAL4+, plus, EAL2+, plus, and so on. All of those are still valid and part of the common criteria certification. Uh, again, NIAP typically doesn't obey by this and they don't go by it. So everything is what's called PP compliant with NIAP, meaning you have to meet the protection profile, PP compliant, and that's it. Again, you can do it anywhere in the world or anywhere which is common criteria certified, but uh, which is accepting common criteria as a certification, but it needs to be PP cert. So if your market is in the US, I would strongly recommend to look at the NIAP certification that HSL has for our product. And if you are in Europe, most European countries will accept NIAP, but there are some cases that there are requesting EAL4, and then you'll have to do a separate certification, meaning it can happen. HSL, for example, we're usually doing both EAL4 and NIAP for all of our products because we want to address the biggest market. Remember, this is our business, and again, in a lot of military and defense applications, they are, they are requesting those certifications, and sometimes they're requesting other, but uh, the session is about this, okay? So this is the, this, these are the base, term, this is the base terminology of, uh, of uh, HD base T, and uh, all the base terminology of certification, protection for and common criteria. So, Again, as, as, sorry, I skipped the last page. In, in 2019, NIAP has released PP4, Protection Profile 4. So essentially, they've released Protection Profile 4. It's replaced Protection Profile 3 for peripheral sharing devices. Again, there were some technical changes, but I don't think they're very important for this discussion. There were structural changes that I also don't think they were <laughs> they're important to this uh, discussion. Again, if any of you has questions or wants to discuss the changes and the structure of a protection profile with more details, please contact me later and I'll be happy to uh, comply and have a call with you, but it's just too many details that are not very important, okay? The main difference which is important for this session is the last bullet here. So we've moved from a PSS, peripheral sharing switch, meaning the product that was certifiable under PP3 was peripheral sharing switch. It needs to have a switching function to a peripheral sharing device, which means it doesn't need to have a switching function. Why is that so important for this discussion? It's important for this discussion because uh, an extender is a product, when you're looking at extension, it's a product without a switching, a switching function, which means that before 2019, we couldn't certify it, but now we can certify it and build products for it, and we can, uh, 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 and we can share that with our customers. So uh, PSD is relatively new. The fact that we can do filters and extenders and all those products without switching function is interesting but uh, it's relatively new so we have products to that extent and uh, we can obviously uh, continue with that. so let's talk about let's look at two use case or you two scenarios of information leakage through a video extender I've, I've done both of them on a video extender but the same applies for a regular extender as well so this is the structure of a meeting room, if you will. So we have a meeting room, you have a projector in the meeting room, and if I have an extender, I have a, if I have a regular extender, not a, not a secure extender, I will have room number one, meaning I will have computer number one connected to the display. Computer number one is connected by HDMI. As we said, HDMI is completely open. It's very easy to write something from computer number one to the display. A lot of the displays that you will have today in the, uh, in the uh, meeting rooms are upgradable via HDMI or are upgradable via interfaces that are there. You can very easily send information from computer number one to uh, the display. At a different hour after I'm disconnecting and the next session, computer number two is now connected and computer number two can very easily read that information from the display or monitor or it can be a matrix, can be any product, but it can very, very easily read that information. And when reading that information, 
it can we transfer information from room number one or from computer number one to computer number two. Again, I'll give a very simple example, um, a very, very simple example that I, I can even de demonstrate in the, in the film. But let's say computer number one is changing the brightness uh, of monitor number one from uh, zero to one, two, three, doesn't matter. And computer number two is reading that bright brightness setting, okay? You understand it's very, very, it's enough by doing this simple activity, I transfer one number from computer number one to computer number two. Now, EDID includes about 50 different such fields that can be changed from the display. It's part of what's called DDC. And uh, you can transfer brightness, uh, color depth, all kinds of information from one to the other. So all I have to do is change simple, uh, very, very simple, uh, items on the monitor, like again, brightness, things that are very, very common. Computer number two will read them again. I don't need to change them a lot. So if something is 50, I'll change it to 51 or 52 or 53. There won't be any visual change on the display. There will be zero visual change on the display, but I can still transfer information from computer number one to computer number two, even if they're not connected at the same time uh, to display. The secure extender will prevent exactly that. It will not allow you to transfer DDC commands at all. It will not allow you to transfer information to the monitor. It will make sure that the flow is unidirectional only video and only in this way. So that's a, 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 an exact case of how do we prevent data for being transferred from a source to a device. The second example, oh, Sorry, the second example that I have, again, I've demonstrated with a phone, but it can be a computer, it doesn't matter. So I've got some sort of a KDM matrix. Uh, all my computers that are connected to the KDM matrix, I'm, let's say they're internal, I'm trusting them, doesn't matter. But I've got one source of a computer which I'm not trusting. So on that source, typically I'm going to add a secure uh, extender. And that will make sure that the information coming from the secure extender is filtered. Obviously, you can have multiple uh, computers that you don't trust. But again, I'm injecting the, the video signal and USB in some cases from the secure extender to the matrix. I'm making sure it's unidirectional. I'm making sure that only the information that I want to transfer is transferred uh, through the extender. So again, very simple scenario. I, I'm not going to overcomplicate it, but those of you that are looking to for more information, A, you can talk to me and I'm going to give you a little bit more, but uh, you can definitely talk about, uh, you can definitely Google something called air gap or air gap separation. It's how do I uh, protect networks that are not connected to one another at all? And how do I bridge those is all also on the internet. So there are many different types of solutions, but uh, our business is to allow uh, users to use air gap network, meaning networks that are separated from now one another. With security, again, there's many ways. You can send it via audio, you can uh, change the power just a little bit, up and down, and then signal from side to side. There's a lot of things that you can do, even if you're not logically connected. As long as you're physically connected, there's a lot of things that you can do, even if you're not logically, even if there's no transfer or direct transfer of data from a source to device. So uh, um, these are uh, two simple scenarios that I... Now, going... To the HSL solution, we have a few uh, items that are worth being uh, looked at uh, when you, we look at our portfolio of secure KVM extenders. Uh, first of all, we have a very unique, and I'm going to show you that in just one second, a very unique DisplayPort and HDMI dual connector. As we all know, HD based technology is HDMI. We are allowing DisplayPort, and not only that we're allowing DisplayPort, we are combining the DisplayPort and HDMI in the same connector. So a user can use either a source, which is DisplayPort and HDMI, without needing to use any converter. And it can also input HDMI and output DisplayPort, or input DisplayPort and output HDMI. It doesn't matter for us. It's all working. 
We are controlling that and it's all done by a very unique connector that I'm going to show you in just one second. We all, we, our design is specifically designed for rack mount and under the desk mounting. So because we have a military use and background and a lot of our applications are uh, military, uh, then uh, we have specifically designed our product to meet uh, uh, environmental conditions that are hot and also be mounted in uh, different chassis and things like that. Again, extra long range, so we're doing 100 meters. Again, because secure extender doesn't or can't support HDCP, it's not allowed. So we are obviously using the most uh, extended, uh, the, the, uh, the most extended chipset that we can, and we support PoE. So if you're looking at the HSL uh, extender portfolio, okay, we have secure extenders and non-secure extenders, and we also have accessory kits like rack mountable solution that I'm going to show you. Uh, power distribution, meaning your power supplies that are uh, rack mountable, and you can mount a lot of them in, in the same chassis, and uh, and so on. You will see that in a second. So this is the HSL extender. As you can see here, you can see it from the video in and video. This is the dual connector. As you can see, you can either connect DisplayPort or HDMI. It's very easy, uh, very easy to see. As you can see, there's an EDID lock button here, meaning the EDAD lock button, once you press it, then we're going to acquire EDAD. Obviously, you don't have to press it every time you restart. We're going to remember the previous EDAD that you've used, but uh, uh, whenever you want to acquire new EDAD, you have to press the button. This is the, exactly the security mechanism uh, that I uh, talked to you about. As you can see, the seal here, that's the tamper la evident label. This is a special holographic label that you can't remove, but if you're going to remove, it's going to rip off, and you won't be able to leave it. And as you can see, the, there's not, there's no audio, there's no interfaces here that are that can't be uh, certified and can't be uh, uh, made secure. So we we're talking about the USB for keyboard and mouse, and we're talking about video interface again, DP or HDMI. And as I said, it can come DP, uh, it can be put as DP and come out as HDMI or DP to DP or HDMI to HDMI, whichever combination you want. We're going to support it. Again, we're supporting the latest chipset by uh, uh, Valence. And again, these products are again made in the US. They're both TAA and BAA compliant, which means a, a lot of the federal tenders that are coming out nowadays either have an advantage or a strict requirements for a TAA and BAA compliant product. And also they're uh, NIAP certified and uh, we, we have all the certification for these products. If we're looking at the rack, again, our, this is our rack, uh, uh, a diagram, of course, of our rack installation. So we have a power supply, a 1U power supply that is mounted above a, 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 a 4U rack for extenders. So all of our extenders will fit here. And the cables will come down from that. Again, this, we have a dual power supply with redundancy. Again, and those are especially designed to be mounted in a rack. So it's very easy to mount 10 of the extender in a 4U and with a power supply custom with not a lot of wires and cables. And these will be, as you will see, both either PoE or 12 volt, depending on the power, on, on the product and the type of uh, power that you need. So again, as I said, we have two versions of this one new power supply. We have a 12 volts. This is typically for a fiber uh, product or if you don't need the solution for a uh, PoE. And if you're using PoE, and this is obviously connected to the transmitters, and then we have a 48 volt, and it's also for 10 outlets. It's supported 10 with redundancy on the power. It's one new in size. It's rack mountable. It's a very good solution. We, again, we have quite a lot of customers that are buying these for other uses, which are not only HD based T. Uh, 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 so these products, again, the product, the secure products that I've shown you before are running uh, HD based T uh, version 2.0. And we have a new line coming out with 3.0 at the moment. The 3.0 is the non secure. You will see it in, in just one second. 
So these are the secure extender, as I've said, run, running uh, HDBase-T 2.0. Uh, as I said, the certification process is long, so it takes time to come out with a new product. But we have, as I said, a, a KVM, secure KVM, secure video only uh, version. Again, obviously it's a diff it's the lower cost, but also in security, a lot of the users don't want to have uh, uh, don't want to have uh, ports that they're not using, so it works. So we have Copper again, KVM and uh, video only, and we have Fiber again, the same thing, KVM and video only. Uh, we obviously providing the SFP built in. The SFP is up to 10 kilometer based on Valence recommendation, and it's all based around uh, HDBase T 2.0. Okay, these are the secure unit, and that's the model. If we're going to a non-secure, the non-secure extender, again, it's the same form factor, but it's a non-secure extender. Obviously, then we support all the interfaces, all your key, RS-232, I have everything, okay? So we have, this is the line of the HDBase 2, 2.0 that we're doing. So uh, uh, I think, uh, sorry, what is it? But yeah, HDMI uh, 2.0, these are the copper extender, and this is, uh, sorry, this is the copper, this is the fiber extender, and this is the 4K60, which is uh, HDBase-T 3.0. So again, we have the entire line. We even have uh, the new, uh, uh, I think it's HDBase-T 6.0, if I remember correctly, but the copper extenders, okay? And those copper extenders are a copper USB extender. They will extend USB 2.0. They're low cost to extend cameras and USB devices. Again, a lot of these are sold uh, for cameras and other USB devices uh, in offices and things like that. So again, these are uh, part of our non-secure line, okay? Uh, to summarize uh, our discussion, again, I, I, we can go deeper into uh, details if anyone is interested in learning more about how to certify these products, what is needed to certification, uh, what else uh, uh, what else can we offer. Uh, HSL, again, as a company, we specialize in organization with multiple, the high security organization, the defense industry, the government, uh, military uh, customers, and so on. We have a manufacturing facility in the U.S., that adds uh, more security to the supply chain, allowing customers uh, to buy products that they typically will not do. And uh, we have, as, as I've shown you, we have a great variety of products. Maybe one more product that I don't have it in the picture I want to highlight, but we've also created the USB-C extender. So you connect a USB-C, you can extend your phone or a laptop or all that, but it's USB-C and on the other side, it's a regular KVM extender, non-secure, and uh, uh, we allow you to use that. So again, we, we have quite a few installations nowadays with USB-C as well. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time. And if there's uh, any question, I will, I'm here to answer. Okay, great. I'm taking you back on my screen now. Uh, Zar, thank you. That was that was great. I had one question. Um, I think you did address it, but one question that came through was um, with respect to HD Base T 3.0 and which products uh, are or are not running HD Base T 3.0. Uh, can you just uh, so recap on that? All the current secure products are not are HD HD Base T 2.0. Uh, we have non-secure products that are running HDBase-T 3.0, and uh, the reason is that it just takes a long time to certify these products. So we're in the process of certifying the HDBase-T uh, the HDBase-T uh, 3.0. It just takes a little bit of time. Great. We, we will get the probably towards the end of the year. We're going to have a certified version of the HDBase-T 3.0 as well. Great, and we will make sure to get the word out once that's uh, that is uh, available. Okay. Um, so, just for everybody, if you want more information on HiSec Labs, uh, you can obviously find it on their website. There's, um, uh, of course, there's a, a contact us feature there, but 
Uh, Zor, if they want to reach you directly, is there a, a better way or through the website? Is that the preferred uh, easiest yeah, way? Uh, again, I, I can, you can send my email if you want. I will send my email, but it's Zor at highsaclabs.com. Z-O-H-A-R at highsaclabs.com. You can send me information directly or I'm assuming that via Valence you can uh, reach me. That's not a problem. Or via the website, that's also okay. Great, great. And uh, again, uh, for everybody, just so you know, today's uh, presentation slides will be available uh, on our LinkedIn page uh, shortly after uh, we conclude. Uh, and also keep an eye out um, in your email. We'll be sending you links also where you can uh, get a uh, access to a recording of this uh, webinar as well. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, I also just wanted to, as I mentioned earlier, um, before we started, next Thursday is our next uh, webinar with Excite uh, and Valens uh, about uh, industry uh, paving way to an industry standard for cloud-based signal routing and management. Uh, so we definitely encourage you to uh, join us for that. But um, I want to thank Zohar again for uh, really um, a great presentation and making something that's uh, really important, really accessible to all of us. And uh, if there's anybody that has any other questions, uh, let us know. Um, and otherwise, uh, that's it for today. So Zohar, thank you again. And um, you. okay. And, thank uh, you very much. Okay, and thank you everybody for attending and, uh, and please join us again. Okay. <laughs>